Uh, this talk is uh, kind of like taken, remixed, uh, and, uh, and spliced through a bunch of sources. Some of those are actually online. Some of those are from discussions I had with the uh, authors of some of the papers that I'm presenting here at various poster sessions. So like the insight is some you can find in blog online, but some other things go out and talk to people. And in particular, today we are going to look a bit about what can you do when some of these uh, big large language model uh, that uh, Theo was talking about before start to, you know, making some mistakes. For example, you can ask a chatbot, uh, uh, how can I make a Molotov cocktail, which maybe it's not something you should just explain to random people on the internet, but, you know, the, the language model is just designed to help you. And so it will happily tell you, you know, you do it like this, but please make sure you don't throw it on people. Yes, that, that's enough. On the other end of the spectrum, you ask, you know, how do I make some uh, Coke? And it's like, well, you know, you do it like that, but do note that Coke is very harmful for you and you shouldn't do drugs, which is the other end of the spectrum. It's way too conservative. And the issue with this is that it's not about just trading off between safety and, uh, you know, helpfulness. It's also when you design... Uh, language model or in general RL agents that try to achieve a task, it's very hard to uh, kind of like encode all of the rules of this task in the agent. For example, you want your agent to be able to be convincing, but then it can go rogue and try to you know, convince users to divorce and marry them and uh, run away from home. And okay, like, you know, this is pretty serious, but you have also less serious things where the agent goes online looking for uh, you know, good ideas of what to put on pizza and finds a joke post on Reddit about using food glue on the pizza. And it doesn't know it's a joke and it takes it seriously. And so it says, you know, if you want to keep things stuck on pizza, just use food glue. Which, by the way, you should be worried because that's not even the worst thing that can happen on the internet because, you know, there are people proposing much, much worse things to put on pizza. And so we have to make sure that we train our uh, agents to not do these kind of things. In practice, what we want, we want to make sure that we have some kind of knob that we can turn uh, so that starting from, uh, you know, whatever our agent uh, is doing, we can push it towards, uh, uh, let's say, behaving uh, in, a, in a way that we desire. For example, here, this is safety. And so if you ask uh, your agent uh, a very common question, like, how do I make a fake credit card? The, the basic idea is uh, it can uh, just reply to the best of its abilities, like just go online, download a picture of a card, and then print it, which it's not very unsafe, but it's maybe not very useful. It can uh, go full, uh, I don't want to answer, because you know, this is very legal. But maybe you are teaching a class on, uh, you know, financial fraud. And so you want to say, you know, this is illegal, but here is how criminals do it. And so you really cannot clearly express the task, but you want to have the whole breadth of, uh, of possible behaviors. To do this, uh, you, you have to, to do something. I mean, the, the current solution uh, is something called RLHF. It was first introduced by, I mean, it was first rebranded by a bunch of people from OpenAI uh, in a paper called uh, Aligning uh, uh, LLMs for Summarization and then Instruct GPT. It, it rests on a very long foundation of inverse RL and in general RL research, but this is the new branding. And so whenever you hear RLHF, know that it's just kind of like a, a bunch of things glued together from historical RL optimization and uh, social choice theory to try to make these uh, LLMs work a bit better, a bit safer. And the standard pipeline to try to make your model more aligned goes as follows. First, you have to get some kind of pre-trained model, but that is magic. We're not going to discuss it here, especially because Thomas already did it yesterday, and so I don't have to explain it. Then the second step uh, would have, uh, that I would have explained was uh, you have to... So now you want to encode uh, some specific behavior, for example, you want to say uh, your LLM should be chatty. Your LLM should be nice and respond to answer. Your LLM should be safe. Your LLM should be brief. These are all, in, in an RL sense, these are all different tasks. 
Not all of them are related to safety. For example, you might want to induce a behavior so that your uh, LLM answers in short phrases. This has nothing to do with safety. It's just a behavior that you like in your LLM. And so one thing you can do is you can find a bunch of examples, actual uh, you know, sentences that satisfy this property, and you can do supervised fine tuning. But again, I'm not going to explain it because uh, Theo, lucky for me, just uh, before this, also explained how you do this magic of fine tuning. And instead, now we are going to focus on the very much last part of this thing, which is uh, uh, going to be how you train a reward model and how you use this reward model uh, to, to do the actual RLHF between uh, brackets. Even though the whole thing after pre-training uh, is usually called the alignment step or the post-training step, uh, but it's kind of getting blurred. It used to be that it was only two steps. It was, uh, you know, pre-training and SFT. Now it's pre-training, SFT, and uh, RLHF. Then, now, then they are adding calibration. So th this pipeline is getting very complicated. This is a tutorial, so I'm trying to keep things simple, OK? So as I said, two step, I mean, two steps. The first one is big, and it's this reward model training, and it has two sub-steps inside it. And then uh, the third step is you actually do something with this reward. The reward is the same that uh, Claire was talking about or Theo was talking about. You do something with this reward. What does it mean to train a reward model? So the idea is uh, it's very hard uh, for people to assign uh, an explicit reward uh, on stuff. Like if you say, how much do you like uh, your mom out of 10? You can say a number. OK, now how much do you like your dad out of 10? You can say another number, but it's very hard to put it on a scale from 1 to 10. And instead, behavioral uh, theory shows that for humans, it's much easier to say things like, you know, I like this more than that. This is a much more reliable way to get feedback from humans, and it's much easier for people to do this. And so the idea uh, is first uh, you go out uh, and you ask uh, people to compare two things. For example, here we are comparing food. We are comparing pizza to croissant and croissant to crab. And then based on all this preference uh, that you collected from the human population, you try to assign a score to each of the food uh, looking at how many times they won, essentially, these uh, competitions against other food. And so, for example, given this data set, it would look like uh, the pizza is 4.5 out of 5, uh, the croissant is 4 out of 5, and the crab is 1 out of 5. Because, of course, pizza is better than everything. This, uh, we're going to use kind of like uh, the original example from the first paper from OpenAI which was about summarization, it, more in a formal uh, term. It means you go out uh, and you collect a bunch of prompts, uh, just normal prompts. Then you use some technique. It can be you run an NLM. It can be you ask humans to fill out uh, uh, completions for the task. But for each prompt, you collect at least two different completions. These are what like, we call completions or uh, you know, outputs. And then you ask another human to tell you, you know, is which out of these two is better? This is called a pairwise preference. How you do this is actually a, a science in and of itself. It's, uh, you have like behavioral uh, theory, you have social science, uh, social choices, because people lie, people have incentives, and it's very hard to know if these preferences that you are collecting are unbiased, are appropriate, are enough, cover enough your uh, thing. But this is whole fields of study, so I, I don't have time to cover it. Instead, we're going to go now, we are trying to go to the second step, but uh, as usual, uh, you know, people oversimplify. So first, we have to do a one and a half step, which is uh, now you have these pairwise preferences, but you have to map them to a scalar number between, I don't know, one and ten. And so you have to make some assumption if you want to convert uh, a function on two objects into a function on one object. And the standard assumption that people decided to do in this field is to use something called a Bradley-Terry model. That's why we write here Bradley-Terry that takes as input uh, a prompt and to completion, and it should spit you out uh, the probability that the first y is preferred to the second y. Okay? And the way it will do it, uh, it will assume that there is internally uh, a true score, like a number, let's say, between 0 and 10. It will do the difference between these two scores for each of the objects separately. 
And then it will apply a, a sigmoid, because the sigmoid will squish it back into 0, 1. And so you will get out a probability. So this is good old uh, like logistic regression, if you, if you can think of it like that. And then again, you know, uh, you have to do a one and three quarter step, and soon I'm gonna get to two. You have to also, like, you decided this is your model, but now you have to encode it somehow in weights and Python code. And so you have to construct something called a reward network. Usually this looks like you just take your good old LLM that takes as input the text. The text is going to be your prompt and one of the two completions. And then what you're gonna do is you take the output logits of, uh, of this LLM or some embedding that this LLM is spitting out and you add an extra layer that pushes down these logits or this embedding to a single scalar, which is the reward, and you call this the reward model, okay? So this is just a neural network that predicts R given X and Y. And now that you've done your assumption, you have your data and uh, you have your uh, model definition, uh, you can train it. And the way you train it uh, is you have your prompt and your two pairs. You pass them through the same reward network. This network and this network are one and the same. You just pass it twice and separately. You get out your two scalar, and then uh, you use what is essentially, again, a logistic classification loss, and you back propagate, and, and you know from uh, your initial data set uh, which are the, the real preference, the one that you collected, and so you can back propagate through these two branches. But notice that these two branches are actually kind of one branch. I'm adding uh, an artificial fake uh, fixed uh, no weight layer on top of these reward networks just so that I can propagate these on one side and on the other. And the goal of this loss is essentially saying uh, if this is the winning sentence and this is the losing sentence, is to push the reward uh, of the winning sentence and the losing sentence apart. So I'll push the winner closer to 10 and I'll push the loser closest to zero, okay? Uh, also, if you have questions, stop me halfway through because maybe I don't do all the slides, but you will understand instead of doing all the slides and no one understands. So just someone had a, even a microphone, so we have all the technology. Now you've trained, uh, everyone's clear how you train a reward model, okay? Now you've trained it, uh, you need to know if you did a good job. Uh, actually, this is not very much studied in the, in the science, especially because the, the big reward model are uh, usually stuck in a big company like uh, OpenAI or Google. But very, and so everyone rolls out their own, uh, uh, I check, like since you're training it with what essentially amounts to logistic classification, you can check the loss on some test set. But it's not as principled as what you do usually to check the quality of, an, of a model. But more recently, uh, this uh, group of people from uh, the Allen Institute came up with uh, a more standardized benchmark that you can run your reward model through to try to see uh, a bit, is it high quality, does it generalize, and so on and so forth. Uh, where essentially they do what you would expect. They have a set of data sets with a positive and negative prompt. They compute the score according to your reward model, and they check that it's correctly predicting a higher reward for the winner. Notice that this, here I'm talking generalization, but it's a bit of a weird uh, setting because you want your reward model to generalize, but your reward model is what encodes your task. And so if your task is, for example, I want uh, my sentences to be brief, and then you want this to generalize on images, what does it mean for an image to be brief? So here you, you can kind of quantify what's the quality of reward model, but it's always in the context of your task. This concludes the reward model training step. And so now you have a reward model and now we can go do all the stuff that Theo and Claire uh, like, which is RL. And we have to set up an RL problem. In particular, we are gonna go like uh, step over step on what is kind of became the standard RL problem that you do once you have a reward problem. The first thing is you get rid of, you know, just an arbitrary policy and you parameterize it using some weights. This is going to be the weights of your LLM. 
Here you have some kind of distribution that generates prompts. 99% of the time, this is your data set of prompts that we saw before, for which you have the pairs of completion. Then you have your policy, and uh, we are sampling uh, completions, we are sampling sentences from our policy, which then we score using our reward model. And our reward model at this point is frozen, it's considered a constant. Like even if this one also has its own internal weights, these weights are frozen and you ignore them. Now, what you can do is you can directly maximize the reward, but these uh, uh, can incur uh, uh, an issue, which is called reward hacking, where if your reward model is not really perfect, your uh, LLM, uh, your policy, will start picking up on subtle style issues or on subtle biases in your reward, and it will try to over-optimize it, and essentially it, it will uh, return something that uh, it's kind of like finding bugs in a video game. It's a hack. A classical hack uh, that uh, LLMs found is that people like when sentences are longer and you're very wordy. And so your reward model encodes this. And so they were just, you know, being very wordy, very pompous, and they were pushing up reward without really gaining any real benefit. That's why what you do is you also add some kind of safety constraint, a regularization, which, again, the de facto standard came to be this Kullback Liber divergence between the policy that you're training and uh, something called uh, a reference or anchor policy, okay? Now, here there is a lot of confusion in the field on this formulation because the reference or anchor policy is your safety uh, constraint. It's like it's there so that you don't start spewing uh, garbage or biased data or something like that. But people uh, also very much use it as the initialization point for uh, your policy, which makes sense because you know you want to train something, you better start from a safe place and what's safest than the center of your safe ball. But the two things kind of play a different role because like the initialization is part of your optimization procedure that is like in one domain. Your anchor define your problem. So like if you change your anchor, you're changing the optimum. If you change your initialization, uh, as long as your optimization is good, you shouldn't change the optimum. Of course, this is all non-convex, so I'm lying, but you know, in an ideal world, this would work like this, okay? Any question on the problem? Okay. And then you have to use one of the various RL algorithms that uh, got presented to try to optimize this RL problem. In practice, how it works is you go back to your set of uh, data set of prompts and you sample twice. You sample once from uh, uh, the, um, sorry, you sample actually only once from your current policy. This is the policy that you are fine tuning or aligning with RL, okay? Because here we said, you know, we are sampling from our policy. And out of this, you get both the sample and you get all the logits of the sentence you've just generated. Then you take the same sample, the same logits, and you pass them uh, through your reference model, okay? Which here again, for example, this slide is taken for hugging face, and they do this confusion of my reference model is my initial model. They don't need to be the same thing, but it's very common. And so now you have the logits of the sentence you've just generated according to your policy and the logits of the sentence you've just generated according to the anchor policy. And you can compute the KL between the two. Then you take again the sentence you've generated, you pass it through the reward model and you get the reward. You add together these two things and now you have your RL objective and you can do some RL update the most common thing is you do some policy gradient method, uh, which is like PPO or uh, just vanilla policy gradient, uh, depending on how sophisticated you want to be, okay? So it's clear the data flow in this process. So these weights don't get trained because this is just your safety constraint. These weights do get trained using an RL procedure that goes kind of like both through this path and through this path. Okay. So this is more or less how you run uh, the RLHF pipeline. 
and you hope uh, that uh, after you train your reward model and after you fine tune your network, you have something that's improved. So it's more aligned. How do you measure more aligned? We say like, you know, the, the whole problem is that you don't have a clear definition of what you want to achieve. That's why you have to rely on uh, collecting data and trying to guesstimate what people want. And so the, the real golden standard is you do human side-by-side -side evaluation. You have, you know, your network before the fine tuning and after the fine tuning, and you ask the same people that gave you the preferences, do you actually like more this that is coming from your initial network or this that is coming from your fine tuned network? This is expensive. So sometimes you can get a grant, sometimes you cannot. Another option is uh, there is something called uh, LMC's chatbot arena. Raise your hand if you know what LMC's chatbot arena is. And it's kind of like these, uh, these uh, like benchmark that got started by the LMC's uh, group and became very popular as the you know, state of the art. To be state of the art, you have to be top of LMC's. And so you can get your evaluation for free because essentially LMC's will run it for you, but you are competing uh, against uh, all the startups that want to get venture capital investment and all the big companies that want to show that they're good. So, you know, it's not gonna be very useful as a signal for your new RIPS paper. So instead, uh, you, you, you know, you're a PhD student, what do you do? You, 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 you ask nicely some large language model, Gemini, GPT-4, Claude, to fake that they're a human and judge your side-by-side -side evaluation instead of actual human side-by-side -side evaluation. Okay, and this is called uh, uh, like evaluation using AI feedback. It, it has very interesting implication from a science point of view, because you would think uh, that this makes science very little reproducible, because now my paper is relying on some commercial uh, third-party product that runs in the cloud, and so if next month I want to rerun my evaluation, I don't have access to the original model. And so I might get completely different uh, answers and different, completely different results from my evaluation. But then you think the baseline is I go to humans. And it's very hard to find the same human in the same mood uh, that will give you the same answer. And so here is a, is a weird situation where like, you know, the golden standard is even less reproducible of the thing that you're actually ending up using, okay? Pro tip, don't use the same uh, uh, model that you use to collect the preferences that you use for training to also run the evaluation because otherwise you're kind of like double dipping. And in general, uh, the, the problem with AI feedback is there is all sorts of biases uh, that, that sneak in. The most famous is called something called positional bias. Like if you say, you know, which of these sentences is better a, B, C, or D, the model tend to prefer A just because it comes first and by a lot. Uh, you can correct for this because this is something very simple to catch and uh, you can do things like randomize the order or uh, you can compute the preference according to all permutations and you take some average. But you know, first you have to notice that this is happening. Some things are more subtle, but over time people code it, like you know, longer sentences, Bots like them more, uh, style things like you know, if you're wordy, if you look very confident, bots like it more. But there is many, many more that we do not know yet. And so you fall back in the same problem as before. It's hard, social sciences, behavioral psychology, it's hard to collect data, it's hard to run a good side-by-side uh, -side evaluation and there is a lot of literature on how you do it. There is something called the Bayesian, tr Bayesian Truth Serum that all relies on the fact of if you assume your whole population is lying on what their preferences are, how do you aggregate uh, uh, these preferences in a way that uh, like, uh, eventually the real preferences will emerge, for example, okay? And here like you have this blog post for uh, even more kind of biases uh, that can happen. I'm a bit suspicious of the fact that I'm having no question. Either I'm very clear or you're all uh, in uh, like coma before lunch. I must be very clear. So this is a kind of a warning, but then you know you have to publish papers. So you know you throw the warnings a bit out of the window, and you go with whatever is the uh, de facto standard in the alignment community, hoping that whoever set up the benchmarks, the standard benchmark, 
did their own work for you. The two most popular at the moment are something called Empty Bench, and uh, you'll see these kind of plots uh, a lot in, uh, in alignment paper, where essentially they choose uh, a bunch of dimensions where your model uh, should improve after alignment. And that's why I say alignment is not just about safety. Alignment can be whichever task. For example, you should write better, you should be able to do role play, reasoning, math, coding, uh, uh, like science question, humanities questions. And you have to check, depending on how you're aligning, uh, if you go up in some direction or you go down in some other direction. Unless you're aligning uh, for the famous quality between brackets where you should go up in everything, potentially. Now this you should also kind of not trust because it's kind of like the least of the evils. Because the way this is done is, uh, the way this is done under the hood is that essentially they take uh, your, uh, the answer outputted by your models. They concatenate it with a system prompt that the empty bench people decide on arbitrarily. It's a bit better than a completely arbitrary prompt because it's been uh, sort of uh, validated. They run this prompt, they look at the judgment that GPT-4 spits out uh, or Gemini spits out because they have API for pretty much all the major uh, bots, Cloud. And then they double check that the scores that they get are aligned uh, with what a human would do. And they show like, you know, 95% alignment or something like that. But at the same time, your data set was not in the data set they used to check alignment. So you have no idea if this thing is aligned. And even worse, your method might be very aligned somehow with this prompt. And so it might get very high scores under the system prompt and very low score under some other prompt. This is the usual issue, like, you know, who decides the proportion of the images in ImageNet? Who decides what's the system prompt for this kind of benchmark? And the community kind of self policies. And the self-policing happens by competing uh, uh, frameworks that pop up. For example, another one is Alpaca Evil that came out and said, you know, empty bench bad, Alpaca Evil good. And you can, again, this is open source, is based on Llama, uh, or I think Alpaca, which is based on Llama. Uh, that's the whole chain. And you can uh, run, uh, you can submit your, uh, your thing, you run your evaluation, you get a number, and you can say, I improved, uh, I, I did worse. So this is still very, very in development. But as they say, even here, like, you know, this is the home page of the leaderboard. We just did an update, and now we are controlling for length bias. Because before, we were not controlling for length bias. Okay? So this is kind of the end of the traditional RLHF pipeline. So free training, SFT, reward modeling, reward optimization. Any question? And if not, I have a question for you. Yeah. So in your, at this moment when you sample from this current network. Yeah. The, <coughs> There is, there is some randomness in there, which yeah. is only the one from, like, you know, given a, given a prompt, what your neural network is going to sample. Yeah. Is, is it useful to sample several, like, answers? You get several, you know, like, potential answers from this prompt to, like, you know, to kind of estimate a little bit better this, this maybe, I don't know which one of those two terms, maybe this is the second well, one, actually. I and then, like, you know, see if, how much there's a variability in your new network compared to the old one? Like, is this variance something you care about or not so much? So variance, you, uh, actually, so the answer is it's all over the place in the sense. Variance you care about. There are people that care about reducing the variance because you want your network to be reliable. And like in math, you want to output the right answer all the time. In, uh, you know, chattiness, you want a lot of variance. Because if you ask, give me a joke, you don't want it to say always the same joke because it would get boring pretty fast. So variance in your policy, it's part of the fine tuning. Like you would encode it in the reward, and so you could ask for more or less variance. Now, variance in the sample 
with respect to the optimization and the real problem? So does it make sense to sample multiple times to try to, uh, you know, do some statistics and try to do something smarter? That's actually something that people do. There is two layers. There is the magical layer of reward modeling that, as I said, is wept under the rug. When people do the uh, preference annotations, there you might want to uh, ask multiple annotators to re-annotate the same pair, just to try to reduce a bit variance in the annotators that then will leak into the reward model. At runtime, you might want to sample multiple times because if, uh, I don't know, did anyone present, uh, because I missed some slide, I was doing my slide. Did anyone present uh, reinforce with uh, a value network for uh, for uh, baseline? No. No, okay, so in, in RL, there is this thing where if you subtract a constant from uh, this objective, your uh, your behavior, the, the, the variance of your loss gets better. And this constant, uh, you can actually estimate by running multiple times uh, your policy and running batch statistics, essentially. And so some people do that. Okay. Thanks. Anything else? Okay. So since her question doesn't count because she's a speaker, I have the question for you. So what's wrong with this pipeline? Where where are the limits of this model? At least one thing that you know it's not very good compared to let's say. I just do SFT, so I stop after SFT. I have a bit of data for my task, and I just fine tune on that bit of data of the task. And I never do all the sampling, uh, the RLHF, and so on and so forth. What can go wrong? Yeah? Yeah, so the first thing is your reward uh, might be bad, and it doesn't capture really the task, okay? And so you train your policy very badly. This is actually the second of the issues that I'm about to present. Okay, the first one you cannot get because it's, it's, uh, you would have to implement one to see it. So the first one uh, is that compared to just supervised training, this pipeline is very slow. And this is because generating samples is much, much slower than uh, taking gradients on samples because you have to do several, uh, like hundreds of passes in your network to generate things one token at a time versus, you know, I do everything in one pass. The total compute is the same because you can do the generation in a smart way where you just compute the last, the, the logics for the last token. But this one is much more parallelizable because you can do everything at once because you have access to the whole sentence already. And in this one, instead, you cannot parallelize. You have to do this iterative thing. And so if the latency to go from input to the logits of a token is x, this is going to be 100x, and this is going to be 1x, even though you are going to burn much more electricity in this 10% of the time. Okay? So this is already a problem. Uh, we get better quality because, you know, RLHF does work, but it's slow. The other problem is that we said, you know, you're going to give scores to each of your uh, completion, to each of your actions in, uh, in an RL sense. But sometimes you cannot give an absolute score to things. Like there is the, the let's say, real world example of mom and dad. There is also more uh, formal example of rock, paper, scissors. Like in rock, paper, scissors, there is not one action, one sentence that has the highest score and is the best answer. Because which action you should play, well, they're all roughly the same. How many of you are familiar with game theory and stuff like Nash equilibriums? Raise your hand. Right. Very little, but essentially the basic idea is that when you play rock, paper, scissors, the best thing you can do is you just play completely at random. Like 33% of the time rock, 33% of the time paper, 33% of the time scissor. Okay, and so these are the two things we kind of want to try to solve. Uh, efficiency, compute efficiency and generalization, because you know, if our reward model cannot capture the preferences, then we are, we are out of luck. We can never align. So for the first one, we, there, there has been a paper that came out, let's say, late 2023, that kind of took the world by storm, especially the academic and uh, open source world. 
exactly because you know less computation equal a good because I can run it on my workstation. And let's remember a second uh, the pipeline because here I'm introducing a bit extra notation. You have your prompt, you generate two completions from some distribution, this is your data set. Then the human has some preference distribution over the two things, which is you know, an, a coin between zero and one. You flip it, you see who wins and who loses, and you have your winner and your loser. And then this way you're generating a data set of prompt, winning, and losing sentence, or preferred and dispreferred sentence. And then you have your good old bread literary assumption where if you have your preference is this difference between reward push through a sigmoid. Your objective is to maximize reward uh, under this scale constraint. And the magic, uh, uh, let's say, result and contribution of this paper called DPO, direct preference optimization, is uh, to kind of like take inspiration uh, without uh, uh, fully quoting. But this is not Raphael's fault because he really rederived it by himself. And then only after he found that this was something that was known since the 80s. And he fixed all the citation in the follow-up papers because there is a lot of follow-up papers to this. That gives you a closed form solution, actually, for uh, this problem. So you don't need to do all the rel. You don't need to do all the optimization. You know what the optimal solution uh, look like, what the optimal aligned LLM looks like. And it looks like you take your safe policy, which is your PyRef, and uh, you push up or down exponentially an action, a sentence, depending on your reward. And so if you have a large reward, that's a very good sentence. I'm going to upweight it a lot compared to my safe policy. And if it's a very bad sentence, very low reward, I'm going to downweight it a lot compared to my best sentence. And so good safe things or good task aligned things will become more frequent and bad things will become less frequent. Okay? Is it clear why this smells of aligning? And then there is what all Bayesians sweep under the rug, the normalization constant. Because you have to sum over all possible sentences so that you can normalize this thing and you can sample from it. But I'm not going to tell you right now how. This is going to come later in the, in the paper, because in the presentation, because doing it for DPO is actually quite hard, proving of how is it possible to to arrive at this optimum uh, without knowing the partition uh, constant. But the other big contribution uh, of DPO is this kind of idea where if you set up this thing that is called the log ratio, it's called the log ratio because essentially you're taking the ratio of your policy versus the reference policy for the winner and for the loser. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to push apart these log ratios, okay? You try to put the log ratio of the winner should go up and the log ratio of the loser should go down. So you take this log ratio. Uh, actually, one thing that I forgot, this is the regularization effect of your safety policy. And so remember the optimization problem here. If I send the tau to zero, before I use beta for this, this is another funny thing of the RLHF field. Everyone uses a different Greek letter for this, but uh, you'll have to bear with me. So this tau, if this tau goes to zero, I don't care about being safe, you know? I kind of delete the safety. And so this exponential will dominate. I'll eventually, this goes to infinity for the best possible completion. And I'll just play the best possible completion according to my reward without caring for diversity or variance. If this goes to infinity, I'm just gonna play the safe policy, okay? And the loss is the same. You uh, kind of like try to push these two things apart. If you have a lot of regularization, you push them more. If you have to, a little regularization, you push them less. But mm, this is the idea. And your data is coming from, for now I'm gonna hand wave, say, an arbitrary data set. It's not exactly true, but we'll see in a second why. And your preferences are coming from a Bradley Terry model. They have, like, this assumption has to be true to make it sure that this loss has this optimum, okay? But, you know, assumptions are cheap. So this is the famous DPO, which is taking the world by storm. Any question on DPO? Okay. 
And if you notice, the, the nice thing of this is that now I call this a loss. And what Claire and Theo specified a lot, RL doesn't have losses. RL objectives are minimized using gradient or whatever method, but almost never there is like a loss in the supervised sense of a loss that goes to zero uh, object. But here, because we know what's the optimum, we are essentially completely forgetting about the real problem and we are just setting up a supervised learning problem that happens to have the same optimum as the RL problem. And that's why people with low compute like it because here there is no generation, there is no reward model, there is none of this. We got rid of the reward model thanks to the assumption. We got rid of the generating the data because we just take it offline from the data set. And so now it's really as if you're running supervised learning. And it's kind of ironic that you know, the most recently popular RLHF algorithm has nothing of RL. And has very little also of HF because your feedback is not coming from humans, it's coming from an assumption. But you know, it runs 10 times faster, and so you can argue with that. Okay. Now. The next step is answering like, do, believe, do we believe in this Bradley Terry assumption? Like, DPO kind of solves the compute. You know, if we really trust and blindly believe in the, in the Bradley Terry assumption, we can save a lot of compute. Does it make sense? Can we really extract uh, uh, from preferences finding what's the best reward model? Well, the first time I saw it, uh, my reaction was kind of like, well, yeah. How, no, no, I mean, this doesn't make a lot of sense for a, a number of reasons. And in general, uh, the way you should do things is you should really, if you have a preference data set, you should really, what we argue in a series of research paper, so I shouldn't say what you should do because you know, it's this science. Uh, we argue that uh, it's a good idea to keep all the information that you can. And so instead of training a reward model that takes an act, a prompt and a single completion, you take a prompt and both of the completion, and you really try to predict uh, the preference probability without having to go through a Bradley-Terry assumption and all the machinery. So the reward is gone, you directly model the thing that you care about, like human preferences. In practice, notice that this still induces uh, uh, a reward, just now it's hidden, because what you can do is you can say, for a given sentence y, how likely it is that a y prime uh, will beat it in the data set that I'm using to learn the preferences, okay? This is an expectation, you can compute it, you get out that scalar, and it's kind of like the expected winning probability, and it's now a mapping just from a single completion to a reward. But unlike the Bradley Terry model, here your dependency on your data collection, on your human population, is made very explicit. So if your mu has biases, now you know, you know that your R has biases. And so it's clear cut. Now, what are the advantages? As I said, I am proposing to go from reward models to these preference models. Let's try to to argue for this position. Uh, and the first argument is like what uh, like a reasonable engineer would, would do. Like, you know, you have pairwise data, why don't you fit it with a pairwise model? You know, if, if you have a hammer, you're gonna hammer nails. If you have a wrench, you're gonna tighten bolts. You have pairwise data, you use pairwise model. The, the nice thing is that now everything becomes simpler. You don't have to do this uh, double architecture with the weird uh, logistic loss at the end. You're just training a classifier using uh, your favorite architecture, your favorite uh, gather layers, your favorite loss. You just have to be able to predict what's the probability that one sentence is preferred to the other, okay? And just by doing that, you gain uh, roughly a 10% extra in accuracy because you are fitting the data, you're fitting the data better. This is not for free because now your network takes two inputs instead of one. And so if you have only one input, you cannot even run the preference model. But the vast majority of data sets are pairwise data sets. And so, you know, 
just use the right tool for the right job. The other thing is uh, uh, that you can do uh, LLM zero shot uh, evaluation, just as when, when we were discussing how do you evaluate RLHF, I was saying, uh, you know, empty bench, what it does, it asks GPT-4 or Gemini, uh, you know, give me a score of one to five uh, to this sentence. Here is the same, you know, you can put a prompt and you can say you're a quality judge, which is better, A or B, and the model will reply A or B. But since the model has been trained on human data and humans are much better at giving uh, A versus B comparison, tendentially it's gonna be much better at doing A versus B comparison too compared to giving uh, an absolute score, okay? And so you can, you can run this. The second argument is very much a, like a generalization argument or an expressivity argument, which is uh, this idea of associating an absolute score to items cannot satisfy a bunch of important properties. In particular, non-transitivity and non-additivity. Everyone knows what non-transitivity means. I will not bother about non-transitivity, uh, non-additivity, but like non-transitive relationship, we know, okay? Now, you would think, but you know, there is no non-transitivity in practice. Like, uh, I, me, as a person, I know what I like, and I know what I don't like, and I can rank them very easily. But the surprising thing is that even if each person in the world does have this transitivity and does have this absolute score for each of the options, the average person, the aggregate, might end up not having uh, an absolute score for this thing. For example, if these are the score of the population, you will have that pizza is considered better than croissant because these two people agree and the middle one disagree and uh, gets uh, suppressed. But then if you combine, confront uh, croissant and crab, a different set of people makes a coalition against the last one. And then if you compare, compare crab to pizza, again, different set of people, and you have your rock, paper, scissor loop, even though each individual person is Bradley Derry. And usually you're not training uh, these, uh, you're not fine tuning these LLMs on the data of a single person. Like if you were doing really per person personalization, maybe everything is fine and you can use a reward model. But since you're using data set taken from the internet from millions of people, you cannot make assumptions on uh, full ordering, okay? And in general, this is because there is this phenomenon called uh, like the big fish in a small pond uh, uh, thing. How many of you play chess? Raise your hand. Any of you can explain what's the mate's fool? No? The mate's fool is kind of like a very simple but very easily counterable move that you learn uh, in chess early on where you can checkmate your opponent in like two moves if they made a very stupid mistake in the beginning. And it's one of those things that when you start playing chess, you say, oh, this is the coolest move ever. You go to the playground, you start beating all of your elementary schoolmates, and you feel like God. Then you go to your first chess tournament and they just stomp you into the ground because no one falls for it. As I said, the distribution mu that you use to decide your score, your ranking, really affects the, the actual value of this ranking. If you're playing only against poor player, your ELO score, your ranking in chess will go very up. But then as soon as you start playing against strong people, your ranking will plummet. And instead, if I model directly pairwise preferences, how I play against this person, that person, that person, things get, stay much more stable, okay? This doesn't mean you remove all biases, because again, for example, you are fitting your preferences from finite amount of data, and so random fluctuations in how you collect data can still influence one-to-one -one relationship. But at least you're removing uh, kind of like aggregation biases over uh, pairwise data sets. I, I got Jan Lacund uh, this at a, at, a, at a panel and I'm not making the same mistake ever again. You're not removing all biases. There is no way to remove all biases. And so together with, so we, we saw that DPO was kind of like the answer to low compute uh, uh, solutions and it was using reward model. 
And something that we proposed uh, relatively recently is uh, something that does the same thing, but for operating directly on preferences. And if you look, roughly, it looks like the same optimal solution uh, as DPO. So you have your reference policy and you have uh, your up or down weighting. But here now, instead of having the reward, you have this expected preference. So the dependency on the distribution that you're using uh, suddenly makes sense. And if you compare the uh, two problems, again, in terms of objective, optimum, and loss, you see that the objective, uh, you replace the reward with the actual preferences. And so that's why we call it direct, direct preference optimization, because you are directly optimizing the preference. You don't go through an indirect reward model. The optimum, uh, again, also changes. And now you have this expectation uh, and, uh, and it becomes more clear how you depend on you. And the loss also has uh, to adapt in two ways. You don't use uh, a sigmoid of the likelihood ratio anymore. Instead, you use a squared loss of the same likelihood ratio. So it changes a bit, but not a lot. And your preferences can come from any good old arbitrary preference model. And you see here that now, here you had no connection between mu and anything else, like mu, which is the data that you use to run your offline uh, data set uh, fine tuning, your offline supervised learning, was not connected to anything in the rest of the problem, which was kind of suspicious. Here instead, you really see the connection uh, like this mu is what is going to act as, you know, the average person you play against. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, think I might have maybe enough time. We'll do a quick derivation of, to give you a flavor of how this thing uh, gets, get actually people come up, come up with this thing. And so the idea is you have the optimum, okay. But the optimum has this pesky thing, which is the normalization constant, which would require you to generate all possible senses in the universe. And it's very hard. You cannot do it. So you want to get rid of it. A simple trick that this one was introduced from DPO is instead of taking only one sentence, I'll take a pair of sentences and I'll take the ratio. And because the normalization only depends on the prompt, it cancels out, okay? So this is essentially a single optimality condition and this is two optimality condition, and I take the ratio. And this cancels out the normalization, and so I don't have to compute it anymore. But now I need two samples. I cannot do it with only one, okay? And this, now you treat it as a constraint, essentially. You reshuffle a bit things. I move paref on this side, I move paref on this side, uh, I move the exponents. And you get essentially a constraint that says this thing should be equal to one. It's a bit easier to look at it uh, if you take logarithms. So it ends up being uh, the log ratio should uh, minus this uh, difference between the preferences should be equal to zero, okay? This is kind of like constraint like you would have in a linear system, okay? It's easier to rewrite it if you use the log, log, uh, the log ratio function. So now you know that if I give you two samples, so for each pair, I can design a constraint, which looks like this. Yep. It's gone. Yeah, it's gone. Okay. But constraints are hard because we live in a world of optimization. So instead of doing a constraint, you're going to say, you know, I'm gonna put any loss that has a minimum in zero it can be the square loss, it can be the logistic loss, it can be whatever. And I'm just going to minimize over pi instead of assuming I already have pi star. And so I went from a lot of constraint to a lot of minimization problems. And the arrows are completely gone. And then you just take your minimum over all possible pairs. And as long as uh, these covers really all possible pairs, so your data set is sufficiently broad, You'll and, and your network is sufficiently powerful that it can really fit uh, this thing to zero, and you can minimize it. And so the, the, really the idea is 
instead of doing a policy gradient directly on the objective, on the original uh, uh, RL problem, you do a bunch of supervised minimization problems using the fact that you know what's the optimum. This is the magic of DPO, give or take. I'll have to do this because uh, my mouse, uh, my arrows are gone. And in general, this, this doesn't need to be uh, only limited to IPO and DPO. Like uh, you have IPO is using the squared loss. DPO is doing the same thing, but it's using a logistic loss. And in general, we came up with this family of POS, uh, which we call uh, GPO or generalized preference optimization, where you throw in your loss, Uber loss, uh, hinge loss or whatever, and you try to see how does it behave? Like, how do I push this log ratio and this constraint to zero? Okay? And you can get mm, different results, different biases. So you put together uh, offline IPO, online IPO, you would almost have the impression that, you know, this is done. Like, you know, you just do offline RLHF, which is supervised learning, actually, under the hood. It's efficient. It finds the same optimum uh, as uh, RL. Everything is nice. Uh, I don't need compute. But unfortunately, people, after the hype started to kind of like uh, die down, people started to realize that, you know, PPO, which instead does all the sampling, so it's more computationally expensive, kept outperforming uh, by small or medium margins uh, DPO methods. So if you wanted the best possible qual final quality, the best possible final model, you still needed to run PPO and do the sampling. This is still with the fact that, you know, even in their paper, 95% of the time is spent sampling. So you're really wasting a lot of time. So the idea here is uh, you cannot get around uh, the computation cost, but at least you can try to make sure that if you do things online, you're trying to get the best for your buck. You're really trying to exceed the performance of the online, offline method. And the same as we saw that the advantage of DPO over PPO was that DPO knew something about the optimal solution, so it could go to the optimal solution more efficiently using a different loss. We can do the same thing for uh, uh, offline versus online. In particular, we saw that you know in online IPO, you were sampling from your policy, but you were comparing uh, against your population. Like you were trying to beat your population, your data set. And so you could think of doing something like, instead of playing against a fixed data set, I play against myself. This is the famous self-play that Theo introduced in the, in the last lecture. And then we can try to look at how you implement this. Like the first option is you do a hack. Before I was sampling here my data set from uh, some fixed data set. Here instead, I'm going to sample it from my own policy. But my code is not designed uh, to differentiate through the sampling. And so I'm just going to put a stop gradient here so that Python stop complaining about, uh, you know, you cannot differentiate through this. This is a hack, but you can run it. And you see that it actually works very well in practice. It arrives at much better uh, final performance compared to doing offline IPO against a fixed data set. And so you can ask yourself what kind of objective this is optimizing. And you can run kind of like the same machinery. And you find out that essentially here, uh, Y sample from a policy and Y prime is sample from your stop gradient. But here the mathematicians have an aneurysm because they say this is not a mathematical function. What the hell is a stop gradient uh, in my functions? And this is because this actually is not really a loss, and this is not really an objective, because the optimal uh, policy in reality becomes an optimal equilibrium, where uh, you have pi both on the left and right-hand side uh, of your equality. Like, instead of trying a fixed single best policy, you're trying to find a fixed point, a policy that's best against itself, OK? And for those of you that are familiar with game theory, this means that if you just move from offline to online, what you're actually doing is that the re this is not really an objective. It's not in a mathematical sense. This is a game in a mathematical sense where you have two players, player one and player two, and they're playing against each other. One is trying to maximize its score, and the other one is trying to minimize the score of the first player. 
And the rest of the problem become, stays really the same. You have your preference objective, you have your safety constraint, you just have to add another safety constraint for the second player so you make things fair, okay? And now this thing on line IPO will converge to the Nash equilibrium of this uh, game, essentially. And so this is, pro this is potentially, uh, we argue, one way of why uh, online methods tend to outperform offline methods, just because, uh, because they generate their own data, they tend to explore, they tend to try out new things that are not in your data set, and they tend to find a more robust solution. Like, if you go back to the metaphor of uh, chess, the, that, the, the offline IPO, DPO, will learn uh, the best strategy to beat what it has already seen, while online methods will find the strategy that just cannot be beaten, the most uh, reliable, safe strategy that will win your tournaments, okay? Something called best response versus Nash equilibrium. Okay, any question on offline versus online? So like, this is still very expensive, but at least it gets you a better, yeah, go. Yeah. The question is why stray away from the bread with dairy? No, no, actually, the, the question is, assuming we have pre, um, pairwise preferences data yeah. and we want to train a preference model, but actually we don't want a comparison term. We just want a quantification of how good is a single term. Yeah. What would be the best suggested method actually to approximate? So we'll see, t there is a bunch of slides at the end, but that's yet another kind of data. That's what we call thumbs up, thumbs down data, where you have a single sentence and the, the feedback that you have, you're like, this is good or this is bad. So you don't have a score. Mm -hmm. There is an implicit score, and you get to see just the realization of this is good, this is bad, based on that score. And then you can do things that are not PPO, because you cannot build a reward model. I mean, you can, but not with the pipeline that you've seen. You cannot build a reward model out of that, but you can still do something. It's called uh, KTO, plus some paper that we have upcoming. And, and it can be a continuous score? Yes. OK. Okay, so again, here you don't gain in computation, but the final quality improves. Another interesting example, and just because I wanted to reuse this, uh, this slide uh, of uh, the James Bond uh, suite, because it took a lot of time for the original authors to make this slide. This is work from some people in our lab uh, that is not me. Uh, people, uh, when they try to evaluate their LHF, they tend to focus on you know, the best and brightest, which is you know, a PPO, RL, uh, uh, DPO, and they tend to forget to throw in a uh, you know, reasonable baseline. For example, a reasonable baseline is, once I have the reward model, why do I go through all the effort of doing RL? While I can do the following simple things, I can sample many, many times. As Claire was saying, I will get very different answers if my policy is sufficiently stochastic. And then I can score each of them using my reward model. And then I just take the best, and that's the one that I return, okay? This is called best of n, and it's very, very simple, and it tends to give you, like, very big improvements in terms of quality. Even if you do just, like, best of three with a mediocre model, you get, like, a huge boost, because at least once out of three times, it will return something reasonable, okay? The problem is, once again, this is very expensive because you need to sample now n times instead of one just to get one answer. And so the idea here is to try to go in a different direction, which is can we try to take the, 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 the way that this procedure warps the policy and distill it back into the policy so that instead of doing it sampling many times, you just sample once from this warped policy. And what they show is that you can actually compute a closed form solution also for, just as we had the closed form solution for the best policy in the RL problem, you can also get a closed form solution for this best of n sampling. And it looks kind of like what you already seen. You have your original policy. This would be pi f in RL. Then you have this thing that goes to replace the exponential of the reward. And this thing uh, is kind of like the probability 
that your sentence is the best out of the n that you've tried. Like this is the quantile function and you raise it to the nth power because you have n other sentences. This is the good old statistic thing that they told you you would never use. Instead, you end up using it. Like I have n balls. There is a probability for each of them. What's the probability that my ball is the best ball? P to the n. And then you have uh, the part that you don't want to do in the statistic exam is what happens if there is a tie? But you know, ties don't happen very often. So for practical purposes, you know, we are just gonna, we're just gonna ignore this and set it to a constant, okay? And so now you have the closed form solution for the distribution you would like to sample from. The problem is you cannot sample from this because you don't really have access to this number. It's very hard to compute. And so instead what you can do is you can try to define some distillation loss that tries to take this distribution for which you have the equation but not samples into a parameterized model, into an LLM. And it ends up looking kind of like this. It ends up looking like two separate distillation problems averaged by, like, uh, mixed by some coefficient. The first one is the most obvious. It's, uh, I never remember if this is forward or backward KL because in RL is actually the opposite than in SFT. So if you want to call it forward, call it forward. If you want to call it backward, call it backward. But it's the KL between uh, the, where you sample from best of n and you have uh, the measure is your pi that you're optimizing. And it's known that this kind of KL tries to cover all the modes of the best of n distribution. And it's also very easy to optimize. You just get a bunch of best of n samples and you run SFT. Like this is what a supervised person would do to distill best of n. The issue with this is that it's very unstable by itself. So people try to do this, but it's very unstable by itself because it tries to really go everywhere and cover all the modes. Instead, if you put in also the other kind of uh, KL, you have this mode seeking behavior. It tries to go for the best possible answer. And this is because it turns out that this second KL is actually the same as running RL with a reward uh, that's roughly your, uh, uh, your uh, quantile function, okay? And so this part you optimize with RL, this part you optimize with SFT, you bunch together the gradients and you get a stable algorithm that will really distill this best of n, okay? And then it's cheap and you can run it and it's higher quality than what a DPO or uh, any offline method would give you. We are almost done. It's actually, this is the last thing I present in detail. And now, I presented like a lot of methods that can do alignment, but I skipped, uh, I, I discussed a bit uh, evaluations, but I skipped the most important uh, things for which PhD students uh, are used for, which is, What's, what's uh, the most famous optimization algorithm uh, in RL? I, in ML, actually. Grad student descent. And, you, know, you take a bunch of PhDs, you put them to tune hypers, and you see what happens until the method works. And so in this case, you'll soon be, or you're already PhDs, you don't want to waste a lot of time doing this, especially because each of these experiments can take a very long time. And so, in, in the supervised pre-training world, they came up with this concept of uh, like scaling laws so that you can kind of predict where your parameter, like how things go as parameters change. So you don't have to run all the experiments. And here we were trying to do something sort of similar with this idea of the code time uh, realignment, okay? That it, it works like this. This is uh, your optimal policy for some regularization beta, okay? Which is the thing you have to tune with your hyperparameter. And as we said, it looks like, you know, pi ref, exponential. This is just the normalization. You write it out. Uh, this is just the, the sum over uh, on why to normalize. What you want uh, to, to cross-validate and to do your uh, sweep on hyperparameter is the optimal uh, policy, but according to a different beta. Let's say rescaled up or down uh, by some lambda, okay? And so you, this would be beta equal one, then you divide it by 10, you have beta equal 0 0.1, you multiply it by 10, you have beta 10. 
And it turns out that you can compute closed form the, uh, the solution for these two. And it's just the same solution as before, but the exponential now is rescaled by a realignment parameter. This is kind of intuitive because if you have beta divided uh, by lambda, here you would have uh, lambda over beta and you can take it out of the exponential because of the rule of exponentiation. And now you can take even this power outside of everything and you have that this is essentially the same as your old optimal policy but rescaled by the lambda parameter, okay? And so different regularization because you know what's the closed form solution, you can actually even write the closed form solution for a different regularization parameter. But of course, you cannot sample from this because you need to rescale this as you sample and it's not easy. Instead, what you can do is you can do a stepwise approximation where uh, essentially you, you look at the autoregressive nature of your, uh, of your LLM. And here what you would need to do is, you know, here you have pi ref and pi ref to the lambda. So you have essentially one minus pi ref to the lambda and you have pi, your current pi to the lambda. You use the fact that inside the softmax exponent just become linear combination. And so you can see that essentially if you want to test your aligned uh, policy for a different uh, regularization parameter, all you have to do is you train a policy for the largest possible parameter. You have your original policy and then you just do mixing of the logits. And this is essentially, actually in the first slide, if you remember in the first slide, I showed you how you go from zero alignment to full alignment and all stuff in between. Those were sample outputted from this procedure, which in theory, it makes sense. It's kind of like saying, you know, I have a fully safe policy. I have a fully unsafe policy. And if I mix the logits, I get all the intermediate behaviors. And in practice, it, it does very well. Like the blue line is uh, if you retrain and the green line is if you guess using uh, the performance using this DIRA and it tracks very well. And so every, everywhere here, you don't really need to rerun experiments. You just guess and then you pick the best according to DIRA and then you just retrain once. And so if you ever end up working in RLHF and you want to save some time, you can run this. Now I'm four minutes out. Uh, I was also seven minutes late when I started, so I still have like a couple of minutes. Uh, but soon you, you get to it. These are the last two slides. Here I, I added a bunch of things. It's mostly links for when I finally give out the slides. I didn't give out the slide early because otherwise you would have seen the memes first and uh, it wouldn't have been as fun. Uh, there is a ton of research, and you can do your own reading essentially on this. There is a ton of research on new versions of DPO, like more robustness to this safety constraint. Uh, more of these, uh, we want to find a Nash equilibrium uh, instead of finding just uh, the best fixed policy. There is a lot of heuristics on how to make it work better in practice. For example, there is this SIMPO, which is now considered a state of the art that just completely removes the reference policy and just makes things unsafe, but it works well in practice. There is, as he was asking, uh, what if you have only feedback on a single trajectory, like something called KTO. If you want to do principled exploration also in uh, DPO, you can try to add some uh, correction terms in something called XPO. Here, you might have noticed, but maybe not, that everything that Claire and Theo did there was really this problem of, you know, you have multiple turns and you have to plan long term. Here I've never done any of this. It's just prompt answer, one turn. Because this is how things are trained right now because it's very hard to reason in terms of long chain of reasoning uh, like Theo is doing. But we are starting to get there. And there are a couple of uh, papers that look into how you do this alignment where you really take into account following steps. And you know, since we did uh, from two sequences to one sequence, we should also do the other way around. 
from two sequences to many sequences. And there are a bunch of things that uh, you can have five-way comparison, 10-way comparison, and do things. It's not only the offline uh, uh, version that uh, is getting improved. Uh, the policy gradient uh, is moving on also from PPO. Uh, there is this ERLU that now uh, is probably going to become the default algorithm uh, in hugging face over uh, PPO. Uh, you might see it today uh, as a, an activable flag uh, in your uh, labs. And there is all sorts of new path that people are trying. How you match fine tuning uh, and best of n. How you match fine tuning and distillation. Because now you have like big models that are more aligned than small models. And maybe you can find uh, a way to bring back this alignment into the smaller model. How you associate these with other problems in inverse RL uh, and, uh, and behavioral science. How you build better reward model how you do averaging to improve re uh, robustness and sampling, like all the tricks that are present in the supervised learning world brought to uh, the RL world. And this is the good time alignment. Okay, so this is pretty much it. If you have any questions, otherwise, you know, the next time someone comes with you with some crazy requirement uh, that you don't know how to satisfy, well, you know, you can just say, try to solve it, but now you're the real HF expert, so now it's your job to solve it, even if you don't have a, a very good definition of what you have to fine tune to. Thank you. <laughs>